Colby Jenkins. I'm an analyst here at Tab Group. I'm speaking with Daniel Nadler, CEO of Kencho Finance. <laughs> uh, we've been speaking a little bit about uh, you know, some of the challenges in bringing the quantitative capabilities to some of these larger financial institutions. Daniel, how do you see, uh, what do you see some of the major challenges for some of these institutions in bringing in that kind of capability to what they do? The state of the world uh, for the last 10 years has been an interesting one. There's been a transformation uh, in financial institutions in terms of the recognition of some of the capabilities around uh, quantitative modeling, statistical modeling, being able to ask questions um, that are systematic in nature and, and have answers to those questions uh, that are very, very empirical, right? So an example of such a question might be, you know, which S&P 500 stocks typically really do well in a very favorable monetary environment like the one we've had, you know, since 2009. Sure. And uh, there are different ways you can answer that question, right? You can sort of answer that question from the perspective of theory. Uh, you can say, well, probably banks would be you know, most uh, positively price sensitive to such an environment. Um, but you know, the, the movement in the financial world has been over the last 10 years to, to uh, greater reliance on actually uh, using sort of empirical statistical modeling to really be able to say with precision you know, across a very large basket um, of companies, these are the ones that typically are very positively price sensitive to this external macro environment or a series of events like sure. elections or uh, you know, news earnings and so on. Um, so that's been a positive development in the space. Um, but one of the sort of uh, negative consequences of that or negative sort of side effects of that is it's opened up a little bit of a, a caste system, if you will, in finance where they're basically uh, individuals who uh, are computer programmers or have computer programming capability uh, and they can use uh, C and Python and uh, Stata and R and tools like that to really be able to answer these questions themselves directly. But that's not true of the vast majority of people. The vast majority of people um, you know, are not software engineers or maybe not even experienced in some of these uh, platforms. And so they're really reliant on this other group to try to answer even the most basic kind of questions with any sort of empirical or systematic rigor. Now these people that don't speak the language so much of, you know, they can't code, they don't have any, uh, you know, robust knowledge of higher level mathematics that can actually play this out on a larger scale where it should be more applicable to these larger institutions. Um, now I know Ken Show Finance, you are doing something pretty interesting in terms of taking the quantitative aspects, the rigorous mathematics and coding and presenting that in something of a, a graphical interface then, where people can have the opportunity to take their idea and apply it to a platform that can be played out without having that kind of mathematical coding knowledge. So our view uh, at Kensho is, you know, we're building uh, tools that try to move that state of the world that I described uh, to one in which sort of every financial professional, even a, a junior analyst working at a bank that, you know, has a creative idea, um, uh, that he can actually go ahead and test that, right? Because mm -hmm. creative ideas are not limited to, uh, to quants or to people who have software engineering capabilities. You know, so a typical example might be, you know, you have a junior analyst at uh, Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, one of these large financial institutions, and, you know, he or she has an idea around, um, you know, right now we're in the middle of a very abnormally warm <laughs> summer, uh, for those of you who live in New York. Yes, and, um, you know, they might have a, you know, a question or a hypothesis around um, which kinds of companies are actually uh, uh, positively price sensitive in their share prices to these kinds of abnormally warm uh, events. And you know the current state of the world or the current state of the art is in order to actually evaluate that um, in, in anything more than an anecdotal or one-off basis, you know, you'd have to sort of export a, a data set um, from a data provider like Bloomberg uh, into an Excel format. You'd have to standardize that data, clean that data. You'd probably import it into R or Stata uh, if, uh, if you know those tools. Even those tools don't really provide maximum flexibility in how you use them. So, you know, if you, if you have uh, Python skill sets or other kinds of skill sets like that in terms of coding, you know, you could create a, you could create a specific study. But the vast majority of people, they really just want to know, you know, which S&P 500 companies outperform form uh, when it's an abnormally warm summer. And you know, again, you know, you can probably guess it's probably energy companies. But which energy companies? There are a lot of energy companies, and there are a lot of uh, companies in the supply chain of energy companies. And so, if you want to really run these very large data kinds of studies, there's no tool that allows you to do that right now without using code. So we uh, we at Kenja decided that we were going to build a sort of a platform that would give people a graphical user interface for 
running these kinds of studies. It's a bit like uh, you know using a, a kayak or a, a service to search for flights. You know, you'd really just sort of uh, pinpoint the dates that you care about, pinpoint you know large baskets of companies that you want to model, and really without needing to understand what conditional if-then statements or anything like that <laughs> uh, involves, uh, it will just sort of run these kinds of studies for you. So that, that's sort of one. Uh, you know, thing that we're working on, but uh, we, we really feel that the next big step in, uh, in financial institutions more broadly is to bring some of these systematic approaches that uh, have typically or historically been associated with quantitative finance to bring those to people that are not themselves technical. And we think that'll be a, you know, a substantial improvement uh, both in terms of people's risk management capabilities, right, the, the kinds of questions they're able to ask, but also a substantial improvement in, in you know, reducing uh, kind of unnecessary volatility that you know, arises from people driving uh, their decision-making process by a lot of intuition, one-off anecdotes, fear, these kinds of things. So it in many ways uh, completely you know, alleviates the need to rely on this very small subset of you know, capable programmers and mathematicians to be able to see your ideas played out. So I guess my question next would be, how's that going to be played out with knowing when to ask what questions or what questions to be asked? Yeah, sure. And you know, uh, to come back to the first part of what you said, uh, it, it in no way replaces those individuals, right? So there are degrees of sophistication mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about quantitative modeling, right? Sure. So uh, you know, it, those individuals, in fact, uh, will probably have a better time of their jobs because they're not going to have non-quantitative people bugging them about simple oh, questions, right? right? I mean, so you can get into very complex conditional questions, right? No, so what, what happens yeah. to the market on a Fed day mm -hmm. when a Fed day falls on a Tuesday and, you know, there, you know th there's this macro condition in the world and the dollar's at a certain level. You can get into very complex conditional uh, kinds of statements which will always make truly kind of quantitative experts necessary within financial institutions. But then on the other side of things that we've been talking about, there's really just a, a whole host of, of questions or hypotheses that people would want to evaluate in a systematic way that are not that complex or conditional, right? I mean, another example would be, uh, you know, when Apple releases a product, right? people talk about an entire ecosystem around that company. Well, you know, maybe on a one-off basis, you can model how Apple share price does uh, when it releases a product. But what happens to the you know, 100 or 200 companies that are somehow related to it or are in its ecosystem? What happens to the price of copper or other metals that might be components of a, of a device that Apple manufactures? Once you start getting into modeling these larger kinds of data sets and these different instruments and asset classes, that's not something that um, you know, requires the full skill set of a quant in the historical sense, but it is something that the current financial professional on Wall Street who is not a quantitative analyst himself has a hard time doing, finds very, very tedious, um, and is a very slow process right. for him or her. So it's really just enabling them to do that at much higher speed, efficiency, uh, and with a lot less frustration. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, well, I think that's about uh, all the time we have here. Um, Colby Jenkins is an analyst, and I'm speaking with Daniel Nadler. Thank you, Colby. CEO of uh, Kensho Finance. Thanks a lot.